Guys, what is happening? Welcome to another episode of the Flip the Mindset podcast. Today, I'm honoured to have the fantastic Stephanie Whiteman. Hi! From Toddy. <laughs> you had to say that, didn't you? That I knew you were going to say that. From Todd home. <laughs> um, so, Toddy, how... <laughs> How was it growing up in Toddy? I am. Um, it was a shite hole. I think. See when you're a, <laughs> see when you're a child, but and you grow up in a shite hole. You don't know it's a shite hole, do you? And it was a great place because we had these big like it was like fields, a big massive football pitch, a big cycle track, and we were brought up in the nineties, so we weren't uh, glued to computer games and stuff like that. We were out, we were out playing line and all that and bounce, and yeah. it was great. It was genuinely area wise, even though it was a dive. It was it was ever dive and it was a fun dive and we dived. Not one of the best places. Though. Aye, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Kid, it was the best Aye. place ever. Scheme wins. Making bogies and mm. some people don't. I, I was talking to a guy the other day. Where was I talking? In Greg's, I think it was. Right. Um, and he didn't know what a bogey was. What is a bogey? I thought you meant like a game of like a like a, a go kart. Like a bogey. Oh, the wee ones you used to think. Ah, oh, like, get you, you know. Ah, you think with them together and drag your cellar out. What, what did we call them? I don't know what we call them. Go karts, probably. Ah, you just I mean, bits of wood. A bogey, yeah. Uh, you know, I know what you mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much Are what it was. Take them wheels off the wheelie bin. Get them on that bit of wood, man. We'll have you ever done it with a wheelie bin, by the way? We no. have. Yeah, we've tried that. Oh, okay, it was so. more like a kind of wheelbarrow kind of race thing, way. But I remember we had a lot of parents <laughs> that used to get involved in our, our antics. And I, we've done that before. Brilliant, man. So I, a bogey was just right. a bit of wood. Like you know. I've got fond memories of the bogeys, man. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> 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 Don't say it. I was, I was, I was going to, I was going to say. It. So this is, we have to open it with some fun because, yeah. Um, this is going to be a very deep podcast, guys. All right. So just to let you know, um, here is a trigger warning. All right, that, that many of you can be triggered during this podcast. We're going into some serious, um, some serious subjects, some very tricky conversations. Okay, I've been asked and I've wanted to do this subject on the Flip the Mindset podcast for a long time. I was just waiting for the right guest and I feel like the right guest is Stephanie. So it's a very, a very important episode. And um, and yeah, so yeah, yeah, we'll start. <laughs> Here we we'll, go. We'll, we'll just go into it. Just talk to <laughs> us about just your early days. Have you had anyone you looked up to? Um how you grew up, where you we know you grew up in the toddy, you know, <laughs> the toddy, it's, it's near from Chapel, isn't it? Toddy, uh, no, it? no, no, it's Paisley, it's Paisley, up Paisley, be near that, it might be my Go orientation's not its finest. Um, <laughs> shut up, it's not as bad, toddy, from Chapel, though. Whatever, whatever. Yeah. I'm not very yeah. good orientation wise. Aye, so I was brought up in Totone. We were, it was a six and a block thing, so it was a close. It was good because we got in with neighbours. There was quite a lot of kids in that area. It was quite good. My mum, I absolutely adored my mum. She was quite young. I was, she's going to batter me for saying this. I was a one night stand baby, right? She met my dad in a nightclub. I know, it's late. I'm kidding on mum. I didn't say it out loud. Um, she, they were in a night out, and that was how. You know, she just get caught, out. didn't she? She just get caught. Right, do you know out. What's worse, see when you get the couples, see when you get the couples. <laughs> that go oh you're like oh was he planned was she planned and they're like yeah mm-hmm. yeah and you can just see the man like that no no no, no for mind it was not the, a certainly not <laughs> well that was that was an unplanned pregnancy if you want to put it in a nice term so my mommy was young she was still 19 and i remember still seeing her as young as, as a child and grown up she was incredible like my mum worked she did a lot of kind of cleaning jobs because she obviously mainly looked after us so she did a lot of wee cleaning jobs she used to come home on a friday and it was like do you remember the like, alien babies yeah. for the two things she used to come home with hunters a day and I remember my alien baby was a night slag because I, I remember at the bells they told you at 2000 they were going to all have babies and I was mm-hmm. like mine was right on amongst everybody I'm like this thing's having babies <laughs> needless to say it, it didn't no. so yeah my mum was she was a really positive part of my life growing up um, when I was younger I had two sisters so I've got a younger sister Samantha she's I think two and a half years between us and then I had a younger sister she would have been she was 1997 1996. This is shocking. I, I barely know my date of birth. So there's about five years between us. It was kind of two and a half year age gap and then a two and a half year age gap. And I think that was probably the, the strange thing is I was I was six when she passed, which I'll, I'll explain to you. But the only memory I actually have of her was her dying, which is quite sad. But I think when you're six yeah. years old, 
your memory isn't it great you don't mm-hmm. remember a lot to that age it's always kind of defining moments so we went to a school it was taught home toddy primary school my primary three class was a it was a it was like a hut it was just a hut there was like 50 people in the whole school it only went up to primary three really? it was around the corner so there was a nursery in there so my mum one day she came and picked us up I must have been in primary one primary two I would have been if I was six and my sister she would have been in nursery so we got home and I remember sitting in the floor and I think I'm sure it was Spongebob square pants I've got Spongebob square pants and I still watch it to this day when the Wayne's only watching oh, it right and I remember sitting watching it and, and this was when it happened I think she'd went into my sister's room she'd obviously went down for a nap before, before we'd came in and I don't know if you've ever heard the sound of a mother when she finds a child not breathing it is one of the I couldn't explain the sound I couldn't mm-hmm explain what it was but I knew instantly when she walked into that room I just remember going John the Wayne's no breathing the Wayne's no breathing and she was eight months old at the time so it was it turned out it was caught death which is quite uncommon when you get past a certain age they generally yeah. it's generally within the first few months so my, I think my mum and my dad they came running in the living room and obviously at this point they weren't thinking about what we were seeing they were just thinking like this is our child so they came running into the living room with a body and kind of hang me down on the couch and at that point I was six year old and I was just like ah oh! so I kind of ran out we went I went down the stairs and sat and I remember sitting in the curb just crying like I knew what I was crying now that we knew what you were crying about but you didn't you just knew something really really horrible had just happened so we were lucky we had a six and a block so the neighbours they took us in and my mum and that obviously went up to the hospital and they came back. It must have been really late at night, probably after midnight. And that was when they told us, obviously, that my sister had passed away. It had been caught death. My younger sister at the time, she was only four, so she didn't understand. And I think that was quite difficult for my mum because she used to quite a lot, like... She'd be watching, she'd be like, when's Pamela coming home? And you could see my mum was like, but that was just an innocent child. For yeah. me, I think even though I was only six, I kind of knew that was it. And I don't know if it was a moment because I seen her. I don't know if it was a moment I hear in my mum, but there was just something in it. So that was probably the, the, the first time, uh, many, <laughs> many traumatic experiences I had kind of thing with through my life. And then obviously it was after that. This is this is all going down downhill here, f- for here, guys. Just, <laughs> 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 just like, I'm starting to use our flight. The the, I, yeah, this is... It. Let's let's take a moment to 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 kind of dissect that. It's a huge traumatic experience. Yeah, you know, yeah. And that can cause problems for for anyone, see, any child seeing that. Yeah. Um, it's quite close to home. Um, yeah. What I've told in the podcast before with my sister's best friend Lucy, mm-hmm. um, dear Alfie. Alfie was phenomenal. I think he was actually maybe older than than your little sister, maybe mm-hmm. sixteen months, maybe. Oh, geez. Maybe not. Um, died in my sister's house. So. <sighs> My nephew got a real traumatic experience from that, and it can, mm-hmm. as me and you were talking about earlier, it can block memories. Mm-hmm. So that's probably why you don't remember anything kind of yeah, before, before that, that with mm-hmm. your sister. The memories might come back one day, you yeah. know. But it's, it's how do you? How, was there room for even at six year old? I'm guessing there's no room for processing them thoughts. No, I don't think that. I don't think, and like I say, my memory is is awful. I don't think there ever was. I remember like there was wee kind of there was wee times I'd be sitting in my, like again it was my younger sister. She'd be like, "Mummy, when when's Pamela coming home?" And I would kind of be like, "Oh my god, like she she she's not like she's actually not coming mm-hmm. home." I think when you say it, and even as an adult, when somebody passes away, like they're dead, and you know they're dead, but sometimes down the line mm-hmm. you're like, "Oh my god, like they're they're not coming." There's wee waves mm-hmm. that kind of hit. Yeah. So I think through my childhood there was that quite a lot and I think as I grew up I almost thought it was a dream I think because I was so young but the memory was still like it was still a core memory I almost felt like a dream like if I, even if I spoke about it I wouldn't cry like I was one even now like I still feel upset speaking about it but I'm able to speak about it because I almost kind of differentiate it as like a dream like or it's somebody else that it happened to it wasn't me yeah. so I think that's probably one of my coping mechanisms which is probably not the best thing but you know I'm, I'm still here and saying <laughs> I, <would, laughs> I would imagine that it would be a long coping phase like obviously the numbness and the kind of as if it's not real at yeah. a stage of grieving mm-hmm. but if you're six year old surely You've got, or you've obviously got so much happening in your life, and you're seeing everything's new into it. It's sexual yeah. learning. Um, I would think that the coping, make it, the, the coping um, for the, something as tragic as that would last years. I don't yeah. know the science behind it, but mm-hmm. you would just think, you know, that it, it went ages on. to say it took six months for 
my brother's death to sink in, it felt numb. And yeah. Then I just went boom. Mm-hmm. But, you know what I mean? For a six year old, I just. It's real, it's real sad. I, I, real I think, think for me as well, it was, I had so many series of unfortunate events. So, see, when it came to processing things, I don't know whether they were delayed or they were sped up, but my processing thing, I'd be like processing one thing and then it'd be a next thing and yeah. then it'd be a next thing. So, I think I was quite, and it sounds really straight, I'm quite easy OC that way. Like, see, something really, but I kind of ease my way through it like mm-hmm. I just and I don't know if that's just a quote mechanism I'd, I'd learnt as a child and it's just carried on through life but I think that's pretty similar to how I cope with it back then as well just kind of yeah, most probably mm-hmm. just keep getting them in a wheelbarrow and kind of shitting them off right to the back the of the heat man like, can do geezer, this geezer break. so on from there mm-hmm. um, obviously you are recovering from that yeah um, talk about your childhood from there to to kind of from there to your teens. So obviously at that point, my mum was obviously getting over the death of her daughter and I kind of, as a parent now, I never understood it then, I was a child, but as a parent now, the thought yeah, like it, it makes you physically sick to think of what she was going through. Yeah. We were children at the time, we were completely unaware. I remember the odd time that she would cry and stuff like that. But it was after that, that that's when my dad began to sexually abuse me. Um, I don't know why I remember it after that. It could have potentially happened before that. And the only reason I remember that, and this is a wee bit that gets me emotional, um, I remember it because I thought he blamed me. Like, the things he did to me, I thought that was his way. Like, of Sorry, that one's quite hard. (laughs) Um, I felt like my dad abused me because of what happened to my sister. I felt like he blamed us because we were still the ones that were left behind. Or, like, it was, like, an emotional thing for him. It was his way of coping or getting over it or whatever. So this had went on, went on for a few years, and it's hard to it's like hard to pinpoint like any memories I have of it. It's like like I'd mentioned, it's like different different parts, different wee bits of it, and it happened over the years. And I remember as a child knowing it was wrong, like I, I knew what was happening wasn't right, but I had no idea what it was or to the extent that it was. I just knew that there was something severely not right with it. I remember at one point, I t- I'd like obviously it abused me. It must have been the day before, the next day. And I was trying to pee. And it's like, see, when you get a severe urine infection and you're like, it burns when you pee. You're like, oh my God, like, <laughs> this really hurts. I can't pee. And you've got to the toilet and there's nothing coming out. And I remember my mum taking me to the doctor. She obviously had absolutely no idea what was going on at this time. Um, she took me to the doctors about this urine infection. And obviously the doctors weren't going to be assessing me for anything other than that. So I remember getting painkillers and or whatever it was, it'd be an antibiotics and a child, a child, whatever you get is a wean for a urine infection. Drink kernels of water, they probably told me. So I got that. But my wee sister, again, my younger sister, Samantha, she was the one that was two years below me. I think it was roughly about that time. She had, There was a kettle that had boiled in the worktop and she pulled the boiled kettle over the top of it. And I mean, she completely rinsed herself in boiling water. She had like skin, her skin just came off down her arms, down her legs. I was at school when that happened. So I wasn't there when that, that physically happened to her. But she spent about, it was about six to eight weeks. She had to get skin grafts, obviously wow. skin taken off her legs and put onto parts of her body, her stomach. Um, so she was in for about six weeks. So at that point, my mum lived basically in the hospital with her, as you would do as a mum. Um, and I was left quite a lot alone with my dad. Time alone. At, at that point I did stay with the neighbours he worked he was a bus driver at the time so I remember I did stay with the neighbours quite a lot because um, I remember <laughs> I'd get nits right <laughs> and that was dead calm when I was younger I'd get nits and they were so bad when my mum came at the hospital I had scabs all over my head that I'd obviously been clawing the life in my head and nobody knows that I'd done for that long because my parents were all over the place I just did and I've still got wee marks on my head and wow. I'm like I've never had them since by the way and I hope I never catch them again because that was traumatic Maybe itself Aye, I'm them. just here, I'm just immune, they're just jumping there to that. See if you start hearing me, it'll be like that ASMR, the camera's picking up it. So I, I was left quite alone with them then. Again, I don't have loads of memories of what happened in that period of time. I just remember thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm here alone with this man, like this is going to happen more. So obviously the, the abuse had continued throughout the years. I had my aunt, who was my mum's sister. She was she was quite young at the time. She was fifteen. Um, I remember she was like the cool kid. She used to come in with all the teenagers, and they'd all be in the room, and I'd be in. It was Venga Boys, and they'd do song "Sex on the Beach," and I'm in the room giving it sex, and the mum comes in like, "Hey, you get her out." Um, but I seen her as an adult at the time. So this is how what happened next. I had like a, a different variation of what it was yeah. in my head. Yeah. Um, Did I you ch- see 
see her as, as being She was an adult, aye, like aye. She's they seen them as old people. Aye, they're yeah. adults. We're in your head, they're adults. So Before you go on to that story, mm-hmm. it's just to kind of, kind of go over <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, we've, what, we've just, what we've just heard is um, probably triggered a lot of people. I mean, it's very upsetting. Very upsetting. Yeah. Um, Especially because obviously the trauma and the PTSD and all that kind of stuff or whatever that, that blocks your memories to, to, for you to pinpoint when it started is, mm-hmm. is very upsetting for me and, and for you obviously, for everyone, that you can't pinpoint when it happened but you just maybe from that first memory you can pinpoint a change in the relationship with your dad. Was, mm-hmm. there, was there a time that he was... So there's not a time you can remember that... He was just a dad. I think I've got kind of some memories. Like I've got, obviously, we did like holidays and stuff like that together. Like, and it's weird because he was still my dad after that. I still loved him. It was, it was always my dad. I still do love him to this day. He's a horrible person, but I think when you've got a dad in your life, you love them unconditionally, regardless whether they're good people, bad people. It's just something that's kind of in your core. Um, I, I wouldn't say. There was certain times, like, see, if, like, it used to be, it was always when we were lying down that he'd done things to me. So there was, I remember there was a time on the couch, like, he was lying next to me, cuddling into me, that's when he'd done it. Or he'd come into my bed, or I'd come into their bed for a cuddle, and he would do it. And that quite, that traumatised me in the way I, like, see my dad's friends and stuff like that. Like, obviously, innocently, they'd be, like, coming to give me a cuddle. And I remember having in my head, like, they're going to do that to me? Like, oh, my God. I I just thought everybody was going to, every male that touched me was going to do that. And that was quite hard to grow up with, because I I think not trusting people at such a young age you don't realise your childhood at that point is is over, do you know what I mean? Because your brain shouldn't function like that as a child. But in my head, like any male that, that touched me or like cuddled me, I was like, where is his hands going? What is he doing? Am I wearing pants? Like, And I think that kind of made me look at him a lot different growing up. Like he was still my dad, but he was like that person. I'm like, don't get too close to me kind of thing. So yeah, I would say it was a kind of a mix. We're going mix. back to the, the, the first memory I don't know if you want to get to, to go into it or not, but that the the, the very first time mm-hmm. is that there's obviously going to be thousands of people watching this who are going through it right now. Yeah, and there's going to be thousands of people watching this who have been through it, mm-hmm. and uh, people who have maybe yet to go through it. Um, is there a certain feeling or or you, you're six year old? It's, I can't even ask that question. It's hard is, to is pinpoint it. Kind of because yeah. of, of someone's attitude, of someone's personality changing mm-hmm. towards... Still a baby. And I think I still was a child after that. Like, it was never picked up on for me as a child. I don't think anybody for a second ever had a clue there was anything that went on. But I think but with that couple of series of events happening to me so young, if there was anything, they would have maybe looked at... Like, I lost my sister. Like, she was dead in front of me. They're probably thinking she's fucked up for that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? That's why oh. she's like this. But there was never a... Like, I was a pretty normal child. I went out, I played with my friends, I done there was nothing that was I, I never became secluded as a child or came into myself. Not that I remember anyway, I don't remember too much. But there wasn't a point I don't think anybody looked at and that's what made it so hard to believe down the line when it came out because they were like she was fine, like she was a normal child. Yeah. Like, why didn't she respond or react? Or, and there was a usual one that does my heart not in, why didn't she tell anybody? Yeah. And you just think you it's just mad, don't know. You just question, don't know. Man. It's such an ignorant question. Mm-hmm. Same with domestic abuse or mm-hmm. sexual abuse. To, to say why didn't she tell anyone yeah. or why didn't he tell anyone? It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, it's obviously it, it, it's obviously you didn't isolate yourself, but it's it's a ridiculously isolated environment to be in. You growing up with that because you talk about later on in your life, you thought that was normal. Mm-hmm. So it kind of changed the way you were with your new partner. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, that, this is almost like you, you get, you have that childhood taken away from you and then you only realise when you're in your 20s. Or yeah, yeah, really I think really... I did realise before that, I think there was, like, in my teenage years when I started learning about, don't get me wrong, I was frigid, I wasn't having sex, but when I started learning more about sex and my friends were doing things like that, like, I then understood, like, wait, 
that that should really shouldn't have been happening but there was nothing there was no major point where i like i, just, I, I can remember just clicking and going oh my god because i think i always knew it was wrong I always knew there was something the right way i just couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was mm-hmm. um and like i said they'd done it to my aunt as well she was she was 15 years old and i remember i think we were sharing a bed because we only had a three-bedroom house so there was me and my, my sister and my aunt so i think i'd shared a bed with my aunt <laughs> and i just remember him coming into the bedroom I'm lying in the bed next to her and he's like I remember I'm just saying things it was like your skin's so soft and she was going what about Moira and he's like but your skin like it's so and as it kind of started I left the room but I knew exactly what was going on at that point in my head she was an adult so I was just thinking my mum's cheating on my dad like that's that's awful that's a really horrible thing if kind of thing with but in, in my head growing up again that was a thing that took me to my 20s to go oh my god she was a child she was 15 years old mm-hmm. I just thought my dad cheated on her like on my mum with her mm-hmm. Um, so it was mad. There was actually there was a, there was another incident. Um, and there was a lot of parties in my house at the weekend. Like did a lot of drinking and stuff like that. And me and my wee sister loved it. We used to see in the mornings when they were all still pissed, sleeping in the couch, and put it with the markers, drawing away <laughs> their faces and stuff like that. We did, and you'd have a good laugh because when you're young, like drunk adults, were playful and fun, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we did. We we enjoyed all that. No, I would never do it like with my kids. You know what I mean? But in the day, it was good. But there was one night I've got an auntie, and she's actually in a care home now. Um, she's got a severe learning disability, like twenty four hour care. But I remember it was me and my sister. We'd slept in my dad's my mum and dad's bed that night I don't know why but they were having a party there anyway and I remember my dad having sex with my auntie on the floor now she had a learning disability back then I can't remember exactly what it was but she used to shake all the time it wasn't as severe so when what happened to my other auntie had happened she was an adult the one that when I was lying in mum and dad's bed she was an adult and it happened but she was a vulnerable adult she wasn't a functioning adult so I think, again, that's why I associated when it happened to my 15-year-old aunt that he was just a cheater. He was just going with different women behind my mum's back. But I know what I saw. I remember, like, I remember my auntie standing up and, like, pulling her trousers up and the two of them leaving the room and me thinking, like, that's wrong. Like, you, you don't, you've just done that to my mummy kind of thing. Way. So he was quite, um, he was obviously quite a predator species. Like, he was obviously out getting kind of vulnerable people. But yeah, but I definitely think that's where the point with my youngest auntie, I thought like he's cheating on my mum. I didn't differentiate it like she was a child. Do you know what I mean? So I... I keep going running circles. I keep going back. Have, <laughs> no, 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 no. Should you or should no, you? No, no. It's, it's just good to to kind of listen to the the experience when you're um, your version of when you were younger mm-hmm. and, and what you can remember. Obviously, there's going to be so many memories. You've never went to counselling or anything over have you? Because no. you kind of you've, you've built your own way to deal with it and you're kind of content with that. Functioning. And you are great. <laughs> you, you're fantastic. You know. Um, and, and and maybe that might unlock too many memories as well. There might be yeah. is, is it a bit of um is a bit of you know, fear there as well that it might just unlock a whole I would say stuff. so. I think when you when you move on with life, I think for, for my method of moving forward is just keep kicking. Don't look back. Keep kicking. Look back to see how far you've come and just keep going. And I think, like, I function pretty damn well for somebody who's been through it. Like, there's a lot of people that are like, no, no way, no you. Like, they expect you to be broke. They expect you to behave and act a certain way or be one of the people that, like, seeks sympathy. And I, that that's not me at all. And I, I, I suppose I think the thought of going back to counselling, I'm like, I'm opening that back. I'm opening up an old wound that I've covered pretty well myself like why would I go and do that like a lot of people have mental health problems in life that haven't had stuff like that happen to me it doesn't mean anything in the future when I'm having like down moments or like my mental health is affected that it's necessarily that that like life's busy like people have mental health problems so I guess I've just never felt the need to go and revisit the full thing like today's probably one of the few yeah. days I'll ever run through it all with anybody um, do you know what I mean yeah. it's quite uh, it kind of brings it back to you and the emotions and I tend to just avoid them. <laughs> you've been on, on TikTok, you're a huge TikToker, you're an inspiration to many, many people, um, many, many women, um, predominantly women, mm-hmm. and um, you, you opened up about it once, when it, when it, oh, the, 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 the post I seen, mm-hmm. which was very upsetting, but you, you've kept that away from, from that side of your TikTok and online. Yeah. Um, stuff is that simply so because as you know if you talk about something people can identify you as that yeah you become that before you yeah. become Steph you yeah. know it comes off 
that was a girl that was sexually abused yeah. instead of their Steph Whiteman. Yeah. Do you think that's why you've not spoke about it? Is it something you're going to maybe plan on doing in the future? Or is it just a one unlock on this to kind of raise all the awareness we can? And then you kind of... Yeah, I think, see when you go through life, and I think when you're given a platform, it's good to be able to use it for, for the better. Like my page, if you watch it, it's just me talking rubbish. In fact, I'm probably more known for my dog's burnt balls that ended up in this <laughs> Ended up yeah, this and then that. that, like when everybody sees me, like, but I suppose they're not going to go, Oh, you had a pedo for a dad, yeah. but they were like, Your dog's burnt balls, can I hang? <laughs> like, I'm probably well known for that. When I had done that post, it was kind of, it was not, it was kind of forced out. It's not something because it doesn't define me. And like I'd mentioned earlier, when people, it's like, see that trend you get on, on TikTok now, and they're like, She's a seven, but she picks her toenails. Like, yeah. I feel like for me, they'll be like, Yeah, she's a six and a good day. But she was sexually abused by her dad, you know what I mean? People just think where, where you've been damaged or you've yeah, been broken or you you behave in a certain way in life. And I don't, and I don't feel the need to be associated with it. When I had posted it on my page, like I'd mentioned the other day, it was my sister. Obviously, she went down a completely different route for me. She definitely has not moved on in life um, with a lot of relationship breakdowns in the family. Um, my mum takes care of her kids. We had them for four months. Um, but it was my, I was finishing a sleepover at work one morning. It was like nine in the morning. And my auntie had sent me this picture. Um, this was only like a year ago, by the way. And it was a picture of my sister and my dad and a house party together. And I just know how that would be. I so taken back I was like I need to leave and it took me a good two days I remember going to my mum's house because I had to pick up the kids like I was in floods of tears because I was just like if I just like witnessed what I've seen um and I'll obviously explain to you later but when we went through the court case of so many people that didn't believe us like paedophiles aren't labelled they don't have a label on their head they're everyday people walking about and we got we got a lot of abuse so for her to post that on social media I thought how many of these people are going to be watching that thinking I have a bloody right and I know I shouldn't care but my ego tells me no fuck you do you know what I mean like and that was I think what led to me doing the post originally I kind of wanted to take my power back as well because I felt for two days I was really low and I was I was thinking about everything I thought Stephanie pick yourself back up like you're better than that you've went through all these years like you've accomplished so much more than you could ever imagined like get it out there and just be like, if you want to see anything, fuck you. This yeah. is what you're going to see. Um, she knew where I live. She knew where my kids were. And I thought, he could know what, what school my kids go to. And I, that when I did that post, that was more for me than, than anything else. Yeah, um, almost taking the, the, the power it was taken away from you. Yeah. You'd, you'd worked for years to take it back. Yeah. And you felt it had gone again. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I mean, you were talking about, it's one of them ones where your sister, as, as you mean, you both know, a lot of the times the accused will go back to the accuser or the yeah. abused will go back to their abuser, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, because they might just feel that's where they might only feel accepted, yep. which is a very, very difficult and, and horrible. It's something I see quite a lot of, mm -hmm. um, doing flip the mindset that they will go back into that environment because they've labelled themselves as, yep. as that and then I'll go back. So it's that way where... It's not more of a case of you and your sister that went down different routes. It, it might be because you've just healed yourself, maybe, in in different ways. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, that must be so difficult to deal with. All of that is, is, <laughs> is, is so difficult to deal it's with. It's a big cluster. You and your sister, you and your dad, your family, yeah. mum, and yeah. everything. Um, before we talk about the court case and that that ensues, all right. Mm -hmm. I just want to give more to you. Talk to me about the things you. You, you loved like growing up and just more about you and you know you loved more doing positive. your teenage years not more positive <laughs> just just who is Steph Steph Whiteman because Steph Whiteman is definitely not just someone who got abused no young. Steph absolutely Whiteman not Steph is so much more uh, I am a bit of a nut job so but we'll no, no talk got, about that <laughs> who's been abused you know? yeah. there's so much yeah. more than that doesn't define them that doesn't no no it's, it's just horrendous mm -hmm. but you know you're you're so much more yeah, I think see see through the my teenage years. I think my younger teenage years, I wasn't like I was really I was really subdued and quiet. I was bullied quite a lot through my teenage years, so that kind of thing with me. But I remember I joined the army cadets, and that was like that. That was a pure pinnacle for me. That was I loved it, and I say I loved it. I loved that place. I joined there, and I was raging because you can join at twelve. I was about fifteen before I joined, and I remember before I went there, like I had a 
the people in my scheme were awful right so I remember going there and I thought I'm a new person I'm going to go in here most of these people there was a couple of people that were in school with me I thought most of these people don't know me I'm going to wing it I'm not going to be the person that gets told a new arsehole in here I will be tearing arseholes <laughs> but anyway so I went in and I remember I felt sick I was ill and I thought you could go in say hi to everybody and just talk just talk just talk about anything just do not be the person standing in the, the, the background so I'm going in and every week I'd done it again, hi, hi, and I'd be like acting all, and I, deep inside I was dying because I'm like, this isn't me. And I just pretty much faked it until I made it. Like, I, I just, I was talking to people, pretending to be confident, like pure acting, like now that way the big flamboyant yeah, people day. Yeah. And eventually that calmed down as I kind of came into myself and realised, like, there's a difference between confidence and just being a pain in the fucking arse, Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And I, I think over time, and I just, we done so much. we done like abseiling. I loved to drill. I was one of the pure sticklers for drill. Um, I worked my way through the ranks. I'm sure it was a corporal or a sergeant. I, done, I, I think I got a sergeant as a cadet and then I went in like a few months later and ended up a sergeant as an adult instructor. Wow. But yeah, I loved how, it. I mean, you're... <laughs> do you do much shouting in people's faces? Oh, I love a bit like of shouting. Because you'd be shouting at my chest. Yeah. Yeah. Aye, ah, yeah, and I've got so a loud voice. Was that like stamping the feet and you're yeah. like, <laughs> go for it, try it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Steph Whiteman! Sergeant Whiteman, actually. Sergeant Whiteman! Say yes! Whatever it is. But you know, it's so funny because the first time I met you at the... No, the first time I met you in real life at the charity match came and you look so much taller on on the video and I'm like, where's Steph? I mean, it's and you just like... bounce up, man, this huge, amazing personality, man. <laughs> Fucking. You've been jumping the corner, shouting at everybody. I'm ridiculous. No, yeah. I loved it. I felt like, because they taught you, like, see all the things we do in drill and stuff like that, how to, like, thing with your voice. Because we, we would do a lot of, like, competitions and stuff like that. Skill at arms. I can still strip, strip an SA80 blindfolded. I loved doing it. Loved wow. it. Um, I was quite a tomboy, so I was. Like, yeah. I remember this. <laughs> That's what I was saying on the phone the other day. It was until I was dating John for a few months my mum's like we actually thought you were gay Stephanie and I thought that's like a bad way to judge just because I was a tomboy assuming I'm gay but my mum and that were convinced I'd need boyfriends I was rotten right enough but I, <laughs> the cadet <laughs> I wasn't in the, the catch of the day put it that oh, way wow. but I loved that that was a big part of my life and that was a big positive part yeah. um, I went back in as an adult instructor I'd done that for a few years so I got to shout at me and and like a lot of people I was cadets with at that point as well like I ended up becoming an instructor and I've still got loads of them on Facebook like I've still got lots of friends for life like people that taught me that were my adult instructors that I then mm. worked alongside and I that was that was a big thing for me and I think confidence structure like all the things I got to see in different people's lives mm. from different areas because we'd travel all over Scotland and it was a good way for me to experience a bit of life that I would never we, we were pretty skin basically I would never experience that otherwise and yeah I would advise it to anybody by the way this is not an ad, but I, I would. <laughs> I definitely would. My kids will be on it, so they will. The yeah. Sure, it must have been amazing for you to get that discipline, structure, yeah. self discipline through self, self through self, through self discipline, and through that 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 consistent structure mm-hmm. would become. Would you would get a wee bit of self love? I would guess. You yeah, hundred percent. You, you, you would start being more sure of yourself and stuff yeah. like that, and it, it, it's such. It's nice to see that you found yourself <laughs> yeah. as well through, <laughs> shooting guns. through acting like, you know. <laughs> shooting through, people. <laughs> yeah, through shooting people, you found yourself. Um, and that must have been a real good focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? 100%. 100%. So you came out the cadets at what, 20? I think I was about 20, yeah. Uh-huh. The cadets is normally a thing, like, we talked about this in, in, in I think, with Nico Carillo, and we were talking about, like, bullying and stuff, and a lot mm-hmm. of... People who do get bullied will go to somewhere like the cadets, Muay mm-hmm. Thai, fighting and all that. Mm-hmm. I think that's anything with discipline and structure. I think that's huge for anyone who is getting bullied. A hundred percent. I really do to go mm-hmm. into these groups and and um, and really learn what it is to be, you know, like a wee bit tougher. Aye. You know, because you know, able to shout at people double your bully, size. We know bullies <laughs> are all struggling with yeah. their problems and insecurities and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, you know, and we know bullies are normally not tough at all. You know, yeah. it's just hard shell with margarine inside. Mm-hmm. So it's good to get in and be tough. And then you're like, wait a minute. No, oh, you can do that. It's like the <laughs> Cobra Kai or whatever it was when they're get, all getting hit I in the face. I watched that, yeah. And then they start getting used to getting hit in the face. They're like, 
This isn't actually all that bad. We're fine. Again. Again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's just a lovely environment and a lovely group. So it's amazing you 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 done that and then obviously worked yeah. your way up. Was yeah, Sergeant I loved that. Steph. I know. Do you know what? It's insane because see if you'd met some somebody who'd met me in cadets and somebody who was in high school hung about the same scheme as me, they would describe a completely different person. Like there'd be three completely different. That was definitely, I think, the defining point for me where I kind of found myself and I thought, why am I taking shit off anybody? Like, look at me, I just shouted at somebody double my size and he's done nothing about it and he was male. <laughs> I loved it, I just loved it. So yeah, that was probably one of the most, aye, that was the biggest things for my teenage years. You'll do nothing! Exactly, you know I mean? exactly. Yeah, that was the so worst I loved it. It was pretty bad, so was but it's all right. Awful, it? We'll forgive you this time. Half Welsh, half American, <laughs> half Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so, you met John at 20, but mm-hmm. before we go on to that, let's talk about this court case. Yeah, well, it was actually after I met John that that, I went, that the cold court case thing had come ahead. So when I through my teenage years, like like I told you, I was ugly as fuck. So I did I was frigid and all right. So I didn't have a lot of experience with sex and stuff like that. I was like one of the last people at my pals to fake my VL, and it was like a washing machine. I remember the first time. Well, why am I explaining this? <laughs> Anyway, remember minus my wife, get better. Remember, remember that. No. The, the, the wash machine kiss. I know. Kiss. I, I did. That was yeah. that one to somebody once or Mine twice. Was at the, the, maybe the second year disco. What is that? The third year disco, I had a silk shirt on. I thought it was the boys, man. <laughs> and uh, I had a washing machine kiss Aye. off a girl. It was rapid. Aye, it's awful, isn't it? Absolutely it was awful. One of them where she was controlling my mouth. Was she? Like, you know just I mean? pure. I can hardly imagine somebody I, controlling I, you. <laughs> I had, I, I had no control anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what laughing you got? I, I you know, know I mean? 100%. But, do you know what? I actually kissed her and it dated her a wee bit after that. Did you get better? Aye. I, I learned, it, so. I learned after the first couple of times and folk slagging me off. Big brother or sister or something Who like that? Who tells Listen, you to do that? See if you just, see if you just Fl- flap it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it about, they'll love it. Oh, no, I don't know where they're going to fit. Uh, <laughs> the movie, nobody explains to you, but like I said, we were in the 90s, you couldn't YouTube it, like how to winch, how not do you winch, that, right? Not you just had to wing it, do you know what I mean? Mouth, so if you're listening to a wee, if you're listening to, like, what's that J out there in between us? The one that Aye, exactly. Like There's people like him, I was listening to. <laughs> you're listening to the J. <laughs> Aye, I mean? that's that's a, yeah. that's the type of person that obviously fucking influenced me then. Why are you but, trying to uh, pump the crevice in my arm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I, I was at mine is shagging arms and um, I washing machine and people. <laughs> I was I was quite quiet. I, th- I think between eighteen and twenty. It was in the cadets, actually. I remember, like, because nobody ever fancied me, right? Seeing the scheme we hung about, like, I was the person you'd be embarrassed if you winched when you were mad to it, right? And <laughs> it's, it's awful. It's awful. I know, it's a traumatic time. I don't want to speak about it, but I have to. It was only lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but people started getting more interested. But, like, I started getting more attention. I'm like, yeah, mm. where did this guy? And it wasn't because I looked any different. It was just, it was my personality was bigger. I was more confident. And I felt like, for me, it was pure, yeah, I look so much better. And I realised I got older. I thought, it's your personality, Steph. Like, people actually knew who you were and, like, got to know you because you were right out there. Do you know what I mean? So I, between 18 and 20, I had a week and a mad thing with winching and all that properly it was great and then I met John when I was 20 but for me at that point sex was just sex like it was usually like when I was drunk I I think before I was 20 I'd maybe had sex sober like once and I've just felt completely uncomfortable with it so John was probably my first kind of main relationship I'd never been in a relationship more than three months in fact the first time John came to my house um, my stepdad's like all right I'll I'll see you later and John's like I see you later and my stepdad's like in fact I might not see you later mate and I had to explain to John like (laughs) it's because I've not had a relationship any longer than three months he doesn't think he's going to see you again (laughs) 11 year later jokes in him but I so obviously in the relationship for me sex was like I had quite a high sex drive but for me like having sex I felt like me initiating it was wrong I think and that obviously stemmed completely from my childhood that was one of the things I was like like even things like even giving him a kiss and stuff like that I was quite a struggle to initiate it because I felt like embarrassed as if I was like doing something wrong you had a problem kind of associating sex 
yeah, with love. Yeah, in a relationship, like a, when it's supposed to be in, do you know what I mean? So I really struggled with that, and I think he noticed that. So that kind of caused a few kind of arguments. And I think it was one night, and I probably had a few wines. I usually have a few wines. I was definitely left a few wines. <laughs> John had said something, and I just blurted out. Well, I just kidding. He was one of the first people I'd ever told. I just blurted it out, and then I was like, shit, like, I, this is real now that I've, I've told somebody. Like, And by this point, I'd have been about 21, I probably 20, 21. At that point, I met John when I was 20, so I, I was taking it in between that. It was quite at the start of our relationship. We'd only been together maybe four or five months. It was quite early on. So anyway, I told him and I was like, for the love of God, do not tell my stepdad. He was quite friendly with my stepdad. I was like, because if my mum finds out, like, this will kill her. Like, she's not going to, like, even, like, as a mum doing myself, the thought that the, the person you've chose to be the father of your children doing that, your kid, that it's unimaginable. Yeah. Like, so you can imagine the guilt, even though she didn't deserve to feel it, that she was going to feel. So I'm like, nope, tell nobody. Sure enough, the loudmouth bastard is listening to her and my stepdad. And he's like, I've told Dale. And I'm like, shit. So by this point, me and my sister had spoke a few years back in a house party and it came out that it had happened to her as well. And that was probably one of my worst fears as well because I always hoped it was just me. And with my auntie, she was an adult, so she wasn't in the equation for my head at the time. Yeah. And then I realised, I'm like, what age was Joanne when this happened? Like my auntie. So the three of us, we ended up, the two, me and my sister ended up going to my mum's and we're like, we're going to have to tell her. So obviously we told my mum, she was absolute mess. As you would imagine, as any parent, our mum would be like... How did that, how, how did that go? That was, uh, it was pretty pretty traumatic, actually. We went to the house. Obviously, my stepdad knew at this point. My stepdad's a dead emotional guy. Like, he's like you. He's a big, massive guy, but he's a pure softy. Like, he'll cry at, like, the drop of a hat. I so I went air. I know. <laughs> I like, so you will. I've seen you crying today. <laughs> <laughs> but we went air, and he's obviously got the look in his face, and I knew he, he, he wouldn't. <laughs> I knew he wouldn't be able to hold his fucking water because he never can. So when Aaron, my stepdad's gave me the look and I'm like, right, okay. So I think we took my mum into my mum's room and I was like, we're going to go in and, and speak to your mum. And I think at this point she's looking, like I think she thought my dad had died. Like they broke up years before. Um, so I think she was. She thought we were going to tell him something like that. So we sat down and, and obviously that was when we'd say to him. It was obviously I had to do the talking because I'm the loud mouth when. So I just basically told her like, mum and dad abused us when we were kids. I'll never forget the look in her face. It's a look at any parent you could imagine like has just been hurt when you was like that. Like she's like, Stephanie, I wish you just told me he died. Like that's what I thought you were coming in here to tell me. So she was really, obviously my mum took it really bad. She had to go to the doctors and get And that was my worst fear because I'd always had that kind of protective mode i was always a kind of dominant female in the household so for me to like do, do that to like i felt like it was me doing it to her it wasn't me that done it to her do you know what i mean but i felt like be telling her i knew that it was going to knock her and it did it absolutely did so it took maybe after that i'd spoke to man and i thought right we need to do something about this like he had kids he was with another woman um so now that it was out i'm like i would never forgive myself if something happened to the kids and it was because i kept my mouth shut all these years and then it came out later and these kids are like why didn't wasn't it wouldn't yeah again i'm very aware it wouldn't have been my fault but i didn't do anything to prevent it so yeah. it's on me in some form so we went to the police station it was bill street and and seat hill and paisley we were there for ages so the three years sat down and we we're thing when it and it just it felt like something like a movie. I'd never been to a police state. I never even got lifted as a teenager. I was mm. like a wee angel, but I just never got caught. But um, aye, so we went down there, obviously explained, and it took about, I'd say, about two years before it actually went to court. In fact, by the time it went to court, I had had my son. He was eight months old at the time before when we were going up to court. So it was quite, it was quite a bit later. But that two year wait was horrific. Obviously you had like the police came out and took official statements and it was very hard at that point because it's a prehistoric case and there's no physical evidence. When you put something down in writing, it has to be matter of fact, like there'd be words you'd have to say vagina, like where did he touch you? You'd have to name yeah. the specific body parts, etc. And it was so difficult for me to do because my memory was all over the place. Like I believe like, I remember that bit, but it was there and then that happened there. So it was quite hard. And with the likes of the penetration thing we'd spoke about, like I remember that time that I was really struggling to pee and it wasn't until I was an adult I thought there had to have been penetration for me to be at that point, whether it was penetration with hands or whatever, but I couldn't specifically remember that, so I couldn't put it in my statement. I could only put like what I could remember factual. I remember saying to the woman, um, 
about the not being able to pee in my statement. I went, look, I was really, I felt like I had a urine infection. And she was like, did he put his penis in your vagina? And I was like, I can't honestly tell you because I can't remember. I just remember like things happening. So that wasn't put in it. And I think that was probably quite, a, that was quite annoying because I thought he probably did do that. And I can't remember. I was really frustrated with myself. I'm like, why can't I remember these specific things? Because it would give, give us such a stronger case. See, the hard thing about that is the fact that even if for traumatic stuff like that and even if you did remember you would probably second start to second doubt uh, de yes, definitely second yeah second yeah because i've been mm -hmm. in a there was a court case i was a witness to at one point and it, when, they, when they're asking it specific did it you know factual and all that rubbish you start to go like I did that. That. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's awful was it that time or that time <laughs> Yeah. Nine o'clock can be nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's it's a wee bit Yeah. And in your fear to say it and then think like when you go through that go, I'm gonna say something different. So you had to really yeah. get like you had to really, really think and that was quite difficult because again that brought me right back Did through... you not think of and, and this this is they probably we couldn't do mm -hmm. this if they were to bring a psychologist in and try and mm -hmm. unlock it through yeah. whatever. Um, it could be dangerous because it could have set you right down how Aye, they could have knocked me right off the deep end. But it also could have changed his we're talking about an evil man here, mm -hmm. an absolute creature of a man, mm -hmm. um, who 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 got a sentence of four years and only done two. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. these wee things could have been the difference with him serving ten. Oh, definitely, definitely. Even, maybe even with the how messed up the justice system is, probably seven, yeah. six. It's a joke. Uh, is it ridiculous? Like, do you know what I mean, and that I don't know. He should have held his. He should have held his own hands up. And says, well, that's the problem. He, of course, denied it. Oh, um, awesome. And I think a lot of the things that went against us was obviously my sister. When my mum and dad had broken up, like she used to go and stay with my dad a lot. She was, like I said, she got in quite a lot of trouble. So she would move in with my dad talk shit about my mum then swap round and talk shit she was back yeah. and forth so when she stood up at court the lawyers were like well why did you why did you keep going back like why were you going to live with him if this man had done all these things to you and then this is when it gets confusing so my auntie that it happened to she's my mum's sister but she ended up in a relationship with my dad's brother so they had a child together so she, obviously, Manny was going with my uncle, who was my dad's brother. So they were going nights out together. They were meeting up because that's yeah. the kind of thing couples do. So yeah. she'd kept her mouth shut all these years. She was in his company. So the lawyers totally ripped her to shreds. They're like, yeah. well, you had your child in their house. Like, what, what is going on there? That's how they used to get pedos away with it. Yeah, it was ridiculous. You know, the um, lawyers. And the guy was shit though, because I remember I went up um, and I'm like, right, Stephanie, the first thing was don't cry. I did great, obviously, but I'm like, stand your ground and don't back down because like you could be the difference between this going, like they've absolutely ripped them to a new one. You can, and all the guy could keep saying was you're lying, aren't you? You're, you're not telling the truth. And the full time I was just like, I remember at one point I blew and I was like, I have an eight month year old and he wasn't well at the time. I says, at home, I says, you really think that I would waste my time to put my own dad in prison for something he never done like for any reason do you really think that i'm standing here for that i've missed work my wayne's nowhere he's with his auntie that he doesn't really know and i'm yep. stuck here for hours i've just had to walk by my dad about 10 times coming into the court case like do you think i'm off my rock kind of yeah. thing and i think mine's was quite a strong one because literally the only thing the guy could say you're lying aren't you you're lying i'm like no, I'm no line. I'm not going to change that halfway through. And yeah, I wasn't there for the sentence and I was actually at work. I'd finished my shift and it was my mum that phoned me and she's like, he got four years. And I thought, well, at least he'd get something. Like, at yeah. least that way, like, it was there and he was out of that house because his missus at the time was supporting him. She had young kids, both to him and not with him. So it was good to know that that was four years where he was he was not going to be able to do anything. But need to say, he, he didn't get the four years, he got, like, the two. <laughs> Obviously, going through the court case and all that stuff, mm -hmm. sometimes that's what people would put a lot of people off. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. to go through the court case and stuff. What would you say to someone, you know, he, she, they, who is going through this to now? Yeah. Either going through the court case, they've been abused and they've not been able to, to speak out mm -hmm. yet. Or as um, you know, just in and and I said, what what would you say? What would you what from your experience? Yeah. What advice would you give? It's hard. It's really really hard to word that one, right? Um, I think for me, for me, it wasn't about me anymore. This is this was my viewpoint on it. Like I'd already been abused and I'd been through what I've been through. <laughs> 
But my thought was, he's going to continue doing that. Like, there's so many other kids out there. People don't know. They don't know this man. They think he's, like, he was a bus driver, for Christ's sake. He had kids on his bus every day. He had friends. He had people. And for me, it was, I'm going to carry not only the guilt of what happened to me, but the guilt of his future victims if I don't do anything about this right now. And it was almost like standing my own ground and being like, you done that to me, but I'm not letting you get away with it. Like, I will stand my ground. And it didn't matter if he get one year or five years or ten years. I just knew that I stood up there and I'd done the right thing and and it's not an easy progress like the, anybody who's who's going to go forward I'm not going to put them under any sort of false pretense that you're going to jog through it I think the 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 main point in it is when you're going through it, just remind yourself why and what you're doing it. You've already been through the trauma. You've been through the hardest part of it. Like this bit is the easy bit, even though it's not easy. This is a bit where you get to take your power back and your ground and you get to protect other people for that person. So I would absolutely advise anybody to do it. It's not an easy progress. Like they do do a... Um, I think we can get a shield that separates you from them. It's yeah. like a screen. I chose not to do that because I wanted to, to, to look the fucker in the eyes, to be quite frank. But there is different methods and there will be support out there. I didn't look. I, I was kind of clueless. I was still young at the time and I was pregnant as well while we were waiting on it upcoming. Um, so I didn't really look into that. So there is a lot more support out there. I would definitely look into the, the places. I think it'd be good for us to kind of like put some... Um, links in for places that do support people like that right. um, because they, they would absolutely help so I go for it because the fuckers are going to get away with it for the rest of their life if you don't stand your ground now and you'll hate yourself for it like when life goes on I've, I'm so glad i done it I'm so glad John went against me and, and told my stepdad because if I'd spent every year as a parent looking back thinking he's he could be doing that to somebody right now like and I'm just sitting here letting it happen because I've I've not opened my mouth because I was so scared scared of what like I didn't do anything wrong so yeah very long-winded way I just do it <laughs> do it now <laughs> it's hard to work isn't it I'm awkward no, 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 I, think, I just can't see it because I've not been there yeah yet. but yeah it's good advice I you can't pretty it up. I want that's to say, the thing. I, I want to really say, I hope, I hope no one's gone through this. Yeah. You know, that's, but I know there is. And yeah, and there's so much more than you'd ever know. So probably, much more. And there's just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just, you just want to see men like this, or women like this, or whatever, um, put behind. Yeah. Put behind bars, and you don't want them um, in contact with. The young and the vulnerable, the young or the vulnerable, mm -hmm. as you say with your auntie. How mm -hmm. did they take it? You know, throughout their lives and stuff. Um, like, did they? How, how did they recover? Who, which like mean, your auntie and stuff? well, like I see my other aunt, she's in f full time care, right. so the police did go to investigate her, but they couldn't get a, a because she was at this point, she's all in care, personal care. At yeah. this point, she yeah. was too far gone to be able to obviously give a statement, so her statement wasn't included. They had to have people that was purely and factual. My auntie, she, I don't really know, we're not a close family that way, and I don't know if it's specifically because of that. Like, we all have to share that same kind of history, we kind of try and. Yeah push ourselves back from yes. it I probably I've not seen her since probably before the pandemic it's been a few years but she seems to she seems to just plod on like me she just I don't I think she did post quite a lot on social media when the court, court case was on and I took a complete I didn't want people to know do you know what I mean I wasn't somebody that was wanting to post all over social media yeah. like look what he's done to me um that was not my that I wanted to keep my dignity and be like this is happening, I'll do it my own way Everyone's and then I'll move on. Though. Yeah. So it's it's I couldn't really tell you how they but I know my sister, she that completely completely ruined her life, completely destroyed her. And it's a shame. She still talk to him now? I don't have a clue, I can you tell you. I've not spoke to my sister in a while. My would sister's you like to, would you like to get your relationship back with yourself? I don't know. I think I always speak so much about mental health when I'm speaking to other people and I'm like, you can't give up on people. But I think, see, when you get to the point where that person is affecting your mental health and every time you go back, it's getting to the point you're you're breaking because of it. I think there's a certain point you do need to cut ties and, and that's what I've done. We had, the whole reason I started TikTok actually was I had our, our two sons for four 
four months. So I was running about with four kids under the age of six. It was absolute madness. My wee boys got autism, but my daughter's feral. The two boys were just as feral as my two. But when they two boys came into our house, I mean, they didn't know how to feed themselves. They were dipping their face into bowls. One of them was shaking when food was coming to them. So there was, there was a lot of anger for that side for me because I thought, like, you went through so much when you were younger and you're letting your kids go through. It's not the same thing, but, like, why are you letting your kids be brought into a life like this? Like, why Why would you... They were found in a house. Um, it was full of smoke. She was on the other side of Scotland. They had nappies on that were pissed right through. There was no bed sheets in the beds, no covers, and it was my other half that picked them up. It was 11 at night, so my kids were in bed brought them in the house the two of them get stuck in the shower because they were stinking and you could still smell like the smoke and the pee off them after a bath so for me like the anger the, the way that the kids kind of lived that's that's it's enough to kind of keep me back um it's so, it's so it's so difficult yeah you understand where you're coming from yeah the difficult part is that i know a few people who have been through some more trauma mm-hmm. who, are, who are the same they cannot function mm-hmm. properly and and the, a lot of the the, the people they, there's a few people i know who have been abused that, that that their kids have been taken off them they don't have their kids now mm-hmm. and they might not ever recover so mm-hmm. it's that way where we know it hits people different i'm strong with what i've been through everyone always says oh how have you been through what you've been through you're very strong about you've been through mm-hmm. but everyone is different i've yeah. seen trauma like that ruin people i mean tear them apart and turn, throw them upside down to a place where they might not be suited to look after their own kids, which is not their fault. Mm-hmm. That's what I think we maybe need to keep coming back to. It's, yep. It might not be her fault at all. Mm-hmm. That, like, she's like that. That's that's the dad's fault. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Because there's just barriers that you can't bring back in yourself to keep, to keep the bearing of hate. Obviously, I can't tell you what to do, but to keep mm-hmm. the bearing of hate or detachment because of that, I don't know, but... It's just so hard and you know yeah. you, See to you be know fair it, you know it better than me you know? That's the advice I would give to anybody else Like I was speaking from yeah. my position I think it's dead difficult when you're in it though And, like, and you're seeing it And it's it's people that you love that are in, involved in it And I think I would love for her to get, get herself sorted I think she's doing quite well just now My mum has had the kids full time since after we had them Did So what? Yeah my, my mum sees her It's only for like they come, She comes over like once a week to see the boys And she's got an older daughter Who my mum's been raising as well so she comes and she has been more consistent and I really do hope that she does get a grip but I think from from my place for my mental health and for my mental state I need to be kind of kept back for her just Which until she as well, your mental yeah, yeah she she gets in and I've got my own kids as exactly. well to think about I can't always risk like I think at some point you can't sacrifice yourself for other people you exactly. need to you need to remember that you need to be yourself I need to be the best version of myself for my kids mm-hmm. and my family and that's where it ends so I, I completely get what you're saying because I understand that that that's the advice I would give to MDLs. else but for me personally there's just there's too much there just now it's too it's too raw and too high a hundred percent a hundred percent so uh, and, that's, and that's the reason so I could change could change yeah life just moves yeah a hundred percent could change are so are so difficult I've mm-hmm. never been in a situation like like that situation you know um so difficult. How's, how's your mum doing? How's yeah? Well, she's stressed. <laughs> the boys, are, the, Sophie, who's the oldest, she's she's a love. She's a great kid. Like she's incredible. And her dad, he takes her all the time. He's brilliant. You can't fault her because she during the summer holiday she'll go there for about a week. But it's not really a break because it's the two young ones that are the the wild ones. Um, the two boys are definitely undiagnosed ADHD. I've just been ripping at them for the start. Obviously, they're quite young now, so they but they are all over the place. They're so they keep her young, put it that way. <laughs> they keep her young. It runs me out of a babysitter though, because see, you take the four of them, mum's like, so will you take the four of them next week? And I'm like, oh, damn it, yeah, I've got the four I'm of them now. I'll it, just man. keep my two, it's fine. <laughs> I love taking them, but it's what hard work. He's great. He's, he's great. great. He yeah. Aye. He's he was all for it. He thing with them to come How there. How old were you when he came in? My first stepdad. Um, I must have been maybe about fourteen, fifteen. It wasn't too long after my dad left my mum that my mum had met. Um, de- my stepdad's name's Dale. He was good friends with my uncle at the time, so he was. So they kind of been in each other's company. Mm. And I remember she used to. She didn't want us to to know she was dating anybody at this point. And with a wee dog Ruby, a wee Staffy, she used to walk this dog for about an hour. And she'd never walked this dog in her bloody life. 
wife, right? She'd be running the block. She'd be like, Stephanie, you do it. It's your dug. So you used to go out for about an hour and it turns out she was meeting him in the fly. Yeah. She was like... Yeah. <laughs> and I, he's a great man and I couldn't fault him. Like, I call him dad and cards and stuff like mm-hmm. that. It's hard to call him dad in real life because I'm just used to going, Dale, Dale. Yeah. But um, no, I love him like a dad and, and he's been a great impact to my life. We fight, like fuck, don't get me wrong, but he's been a great impact on my life and he's been great for my mum and I, he's, he's a good person, so he is. I'm glad he's so you've there. you've got two kids now. Mm-hmm. Um, one of your children are autistic. Mm-hmm. And the other, you say, is feral? Aye, 100%. She's me. <laughs> she's, she's a mini version of me. It's a hippie. Reincarnated. Aye, um, karma. And you John. Obviously, you've been with John, what, 11 years? That'd be 11 years this Amazing. year. Mm-hmm. So, I He survived you, a long time. Do you feel you're more, you know, vigilant on, like stuff like who's near your kids and all 100%, that hundred kind percent of yeah my kids haven't stayed with anybody other than family if i think my in fact my daughter went away and it was a wee best friend for school um for overnight with a friend and it was like her mum and dad and i know them quite well i've met them but see, even at that still sitting there thinking she's in another house with other people like i knew they were all sharing the room the girls and stuff like that but you still have that gut wrenching but i think at the same time you can't bubble wrap them their whole life um, yeah. i'm really bad for that we've got a park like just over the road and if they go over there i'm in bits i'm like hey, where are they what's going on um there's certain points you've got to but yeah I, I definitely am quite vigilant as to who i leave my kids with and the situations going out to play i need to know where they are all the time um I, i'm that more i'm that more i can't believe i've turned into that more i'm, I'm her i'm her Nothing wrong with being that more. You're, you're, you're an absolute fantastic mum um, before we wrap it up i just want to say yeah how proud as, as a friend how proud i am of you thanks and um how happy i am you've come on thank you it's, it's it's a very difficult subject to talk about, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I feel you can only really shed opinion on if you've been in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like many things, you know, like, I've no idea what that would feel like. I don't, it, it scares the living shits out of me, you know. I've got a two-year-old, two, two, two years once Jesus and it's just your it's your worst nightmare isn't it? So, <laughs> and it's all doing healthy there age wise yeah. by the way they're wild when they turn oh, three he's up he's already wild man. <laughs> he is already wild all I get now is daddy daddy and he'll run in with his potty and go boo boo it's a big stinky jobby <laughs> At least he's doing it in the potty, knowing your bones. Well, he pissed on me while we were watching Paw Patrol the other day. I felt this kind of sensation. I'm like, oh, my fucking leg's burning, man. And I've lifted him up and he's just pissing everywhere. Happy days. As we're trying to potty train him. But it's good fun. <laughs> but yeah, worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. My absolute worst nightmare, you know, from for any parent, for mm-hmm. anyone. Yeah. Not just for any parent. Let's take the parent away. It's for any child, for mm-hmm. anything. For a- anyone t- associated with with this and um, I think do you, do you think then before we wrap up do you think there needs to be more done off like social services the government stuff absolutely like that? 100% a lot more support out there I think I the think. children are getting failed yeah 100, 100% 100% I think things have moved a lot like I said I was brought up in the 90s so it's a bit different I think the system is totally different but regarding our court case and stuff like that it just felt like we were just left for months we didn't know what was happening it was really it was a really difficult process and we didn't have anybody who even phoned us to check up on us like see if there was charity lines that had people going through cases like that where they could call them up and be like look i'm really struggling this has been that many months i, I don't know how to feel some just somebody for people like that to talk to that and they know what they're talking about people who know about the system and how it's working because for me I was almost like blindsiding your way through it and it was terrifying terrifying I bet it almost makes you feel like the the perpetrator instead yeah the victim uh huh yeah, 100% a, a shambles maybe mm-hmm. something we need to to raise more awareness yeah. on but listen thank you so much for coming on it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for um, having me you know, it's been it's been totally me you express that pleasure having you on um yeah, it's something that is going to stay with us. Um, this episode, hopefully, we can raise more awareness in mm-hmm. some way, whether it be us doing a wee day or a wee awareness day or yep. something. Obviously, you've not talked about this a lot. This is probably the second time you've talked about this online. Yeah, I know it's something you might not be open to doing more because it, and it, just <laughs> like me when I talk about my mental health all the it's time, hard. it does put me in a difficult place. I go home after most podcasts mm-hmm. and I have to pick myself back up when I've opened. Like not today because it's not you know I've been I've not said much about my life but mm-hmm. you have to go and pick yourself up and be like 
Aye, you know breathe. Yeah, yeah wow. no, I get that. You know, and, mm-hmm. and all, all, all the previous guests have done the same. So it, it's tough talking and opening up all the time. Mm-hmm. Going to speak places. I hope people re- reach out if you're going to shed a tear. <laughs> listen, I think you've been phenomenal. I'm what Honestly. I caught quite well. I you're didn't so, cry that much, so, did I? So brave. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. An inspiration, and I, I hope that. Your story gets heard off of thousands and, and it can bring a lot of people forward. Yeah. Maybe help be shining light. And my inbox is always things. open on, on my Instagram. It's quite it's easy, a lot easier to message me on there. Yeah, your Instagram is... It's at Steph Whiteman 1, I'm sure. Steph Something. Whiteman 1. I could tag it sure? in the wee it's thing. Steph White 87? Was it I wasn't born in 87. Oh, were, no, I was nine, no, it's Steph Whiteman 1, I'm sure it is. We can tag it down below. Yeah, but we'll my, my request, it's a lot easier to get them than TikTok, but I'm, I'm always open to The last time I had a she's lot of people. TikTok, <laughs> no, you need to follow each other back. Instagram's the place. If, if anybody was ever wanting a wee chat or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to, to have a word with them. What I will say as well, guys, if any of you at home are struggling with your mental health, um, get in touch with either me or Steph. You know, there's there's places like Chris's house and stuff like that. We'll tag below. Now, if you are currently being abused or um, you have been abused and it's something you want to talk about or open up about or go and see someone about, whether it via counselling or, or getting your story out there, um, I'm going to put a load of links in the description. Um, I won't put you in contact with me directly because I don't know enough about it. I'll put you in contact with Steph if if you want to mm-hmm. Instagram Steph for a wee bit of advice, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll absolutely, hundred percent. And it, the other links I'll put will be professionals, people, all right. But please suffer in silence, okay? Have a good day. Thank you.